today. Welcome to the Conscious Vibe. My name is Charles Mitchell. I'm here with my pod partner, Dr. Daryl Jones. Good morning. DJ, good to see you as good always. Good to see you as always. Yeah. Uh, today we have a guest with us, uh, Jim Mitchell, uh, someone I've met probably in the last 10 years or so through my affiliation with YPO. Jim is a corporate trainer, YPO resource, um, much more than that. He, he has a, his website says Leadership Magic. Mm. And um, uh, there's a lot of magic in his work in terms of the transformation that he does with leaders and individuals. So, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Well, good to be here. Thanks for the invite. Are you guys related? We went through that whole, you know, yeah. deal. Of, we couldn't find anything. Yeah, we Didn't couldn't find, find anything. anything. Okay. No. No, we did go through that exercise. Unless, of course, he's rich and going to leave me something, then I'm, then I'm pretty <laughs> well, sure we're I, related. I can, guarantee, I can guarantee you the first part is true. I don't know if he's going to leave you anything. Because, <laughs> man, he is my cousin. <laughs> I tell you, always a problem. Uh, Jim, uh, for, for DJ and for our audience, uh, give us a little bit about your background, um, where you grew up. I know you Hmm. Born and raised here in Arizona, but give us some more context around uh, your life and what's led you to where you are today. Sure. So I born and raised here in Arizona. My parents moved here from Louisiana right after my uh, dad got out of the service in the Second World War. So 1949, him and the neighbor built a little house out there in Chandler in what used to be a cotton field in 1953. And so my oldest brother was born in New Orleans, and then the rest of us were born here. Um and, you know, that's had an upside and a downside. You know, the downside, again, as I was joking earlier, there's a real small population of African Americans here. And out in Chandler, even worse, because Chandler used to be, like, across 20 miles of cotton and alfalfa fields from Mesa and Phoenix and everything else. So a little small place. And But the other, th the other thing that it did was it uh, Chandler was too small to segregate schools back then. And so... I ended up going to integrated schools from the time I was in kindergarten. And so when I look at my pictures of, of uh, you know, first, second, third grade, all those pictures that moms kept, um, it's a mixture of, you know, poor black folks, poor white folks, Mexicans, Indians from the reservation south of Chandler. Um, and so I thought that's what the world looked like. And, you know, it, it, one of the upsides is that is it helped me uh, demystify white people, demystify Mexicans, demystify Indians, and just kind of see them as other people. And that has served uh, pretty well. So went to Arizona State, um, have an undergrad degree in Spanish and Latin American studies and education, taught for a couple of years in the public school system, got tired of being broke, so I left that. And through uh, just happenstance, fell into a job on the uh, what used to be a huge bank here, Valley National Bank of Arizona, and got on their management training program. Spent 18 years there. I'm not a banker. I've never seen myself as a banker. So I'm not fascinated. Yeah, I'm not fascinated by numbers or anything like that. But it was like this is better than being broke as a teacher of a middle school, right? And so and. I figured one of the gifts of birth is I have a really good brain, so I was just willing to outthink and outwork everybody else and claw my way to the top. So after 18 years of that, I um, hit a point where in the last five years, it was just really heavy to be in banking. I begin to recognize, I started working on myself, and it was just re realizing more and more that this is no fun anymore, that I really don't care about banking, I don't care about any of that. And so I walked away from my job as a regional vice president with that bank in 1998, decided to strike out on my own. Been out here in the world striking out on my own ever since. So I work as a leadership and high performance teaming consultant. Uh, I've done a lot of work in kind of the startup industry. I like working there, uh, mostly because their cultures aren't set. And so um, they're more open to anything that they think might help them actually make the make whatever they're you know developing enterprises work. And so, and uh, as you guys well know, when you're starting something like that, you know there's a bunch of stuff that gets left behind till last, like HR and training and all that stuff. Just gets that's the last thing you do. Mm -hmm. You know you're too busy trying to monetize to get the product to work and then to monetize it. And so I, I kind of feel that void for glassdoor.com and harness.com and spreetail.com and a bunch of entities. And that's what I still do, do my own work. Um, 
one of the things I remember from being in banking was I used to pay top shelf money for top shelf stuff from Covey and all of those kind of people who were popular at the time from my managers. And I would have about this much incremental shift in behavior six weeks later after, you know, paying $1,000 a head for training. And it was just like, eh. So I did something that combined um, several things. Uh, I had started working on me in 1990, basically. And the reason was I... uh, hmm. I did something that I still carry some pain around, and that was I, I had an affair uh, 14 months into my new marriage, and that went on for four years. Um, I'm, I was, I'm not that man anymore, but that place where somehow logically I had justified it. I was completely out of touch with any and all of my feelings at that point. So logically I could justify it. I was unhappy. You know, my wife was traditional Mexican, living with her mom when I married her. And um, so she didn't know a lot about, about men, about anything. And I just got frustrated pretty early in that relationship and figured I'll just make myself happy by finding, you know, a fling on the side that went on for four years. Well, we had had a child in the last year of that marriage, um, my daughter, Anna, who's 30 today. And the thing that as I continued to work on me, because I was just getting sicker and sicker there at the bank, I started looking out for anything that was just about exploring self. And as I did that more and more and more, I, I reached a point where I had to disclose the affair to Carol. Uh, and so I did that, and then, you know, two weeks later, she took my 10-month-old daughter at the time and left. And... um that's kind of what really, that was kind of the hammer strike on my consciousness, on my heart, on my soul that basically said, I have fucked up. And how do I not do that again? And as I started seeking out things about exploring the self, and that was kind of the tail end of the men's movement, so I was starting to work with men. Um, I discovered there were other men struggling also trying to figure out identity and who they are and what they want to be about. And... In that, um, started, got real involved with the men's work. Did that for 18, 19 straight years. Led hundreds of trainings of men all over the world. You want to have some fun. Go on a training with 35 to 40 men working on their hearts and soul and a, another staff of 60 more. And so those were amazing four-day adventures. I paid attention a lot as men were doing their individual and small group work and just very transformational stuff. And I just filed it all the way. I noticed what worked and what didn't work. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, really appreciate you being transparent. Mm. Uh, the premise of this show, Charles and I talk about it all the time, is we want to create a forum for transparency because we try to be as transparent as possible. Yeah. So you starting that way, uh, we really appreciate that. You know, what, I know you have a question for Jim, but I just wanted to hop in real quick. You know, part of me is not surprised by what Jim shared with us in terms of that level of vulnerability and transparency, largely because that is what he teaches, and I think he lives that too, right? And I think that's part of the experience I've had with him, mm-hmm. which is why, um, you know, I think so many people or so many uh leaders, whether they're in corporate America or whether they're just individuals trying to make their lives better, I think they really do value the work that you do, Jim. I yeah, appreciate that. I, you know, anything I've read about you, which I've done some extensive reading about you, um, I would echo that. that. That's what I found. That's why I'm so excited that mm. you're here today. But one of the questions I have, and it's a comment and a question, I've talked to Charles about this in my doctoral studies. One of the things I started to move away from and into was adopting content to creating content. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because part of part of our lack of willingness to create content sometimes is low self-confidence. Right. It's not that we don't have the experiences. Right. We don't quite know how to put it together. And moreover, we don't trust ourselves. Can you talk to me about that journey, that transition into, yeah, I see all these books and I see all this out here. I'm paying for it. 
let me start to become a content creator. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that transition a little bit? Sure. I mean, that's really clear. So that was in the last year um, in, my, um, in my banking executive career, so 1997 or so. Um, and, and what had happened, by then I had um, been doing the men's work for since 93, so a number of years of that, really filing stuff away. And after I, you know, again, got really upset with wasting money on a lot of top shelf training, decided I'm going to do some stuff that I think might work, might help my managers build a better bond with each other, be more effective. So the first process I actually created on the 30th floor at Chase, Chase Tower in downtown Phoenix in a training room was something I called Life Story. And I basically invited people in this room, put them in a circle of chairs. So, you know, they came in there in suits and ties and stuff and freaked out. The lights is low and every, it, this, this whole regional meeting is in a circle. And I sat them down in a circle and basically said, here's what we're going to do. Um, you will have 15 minutes to invite us into your life. However you want to do that, whatever you want to share, always be mindful, share, you know, stuff. You're not going to be embarrassed about people knowing the next day because, you know, we're, we're in this work building. These are your workmates, but share. And I'll go first. And so I just kind of laid my life out. The struggle with growing up with super religious parents, you know, the struggle with being one of 11 kids and not even sure most of the time my dad knew which one I was because it was, I had six sisters and, and four brothers, and all in that little house out in Chandler, you know, the struggle of picking cotton at five years old and all of that stuff uh, that comes with growing up poor and just trying to make money any kind of which way. Um, the struggle of trying to figure out who I was, you know, as a young black kid in a high school, which I think there were seven black folks in my generation at high school at Chandler. So I graduated in 72. How many total students? Um, my graduating class was 350. Uh, the total number was probably around the grand or so with the other three classes. But um, one of the things, I just laid all that out for him. I told him about the divorce. I told him about the affair. I told him about the pain and the price I had paid for that, of now my daughter living two, three hours away, going from seeing me every night for the first 10 months of her life to seeing me you know, every six to eight weeks when I could work it in between the banking stuff. And then I stopped. And I looked around, and I'm just like, whoever wants to go, you can go. And um, somebody stepped into that. And the next uh, four hours were absolutely stunning to me. Uh, I'll share one piece because it's been a long time, but one of the women who grew up in Mexico shared about She's always had the gift of kind of foreseeing things. She could just kind of tell when things were about to happen. And so people thought she was a witch. And so her mom stopped touching her because her mom thought she was a witch. So as a child, her mom would never touch her again. And I'm, I mean, I'm just sitting there. The whole room is in tears. The men and the men managers for me, the women, everybody's in tears. And I had my HR manager, this black woman, sitting right next to me. And every now, her name was Aloma, and every now and then I would lean over and go, am I in big fucking trouble here? <laughs> and she would go, you're getting close. I mean, this was stuff that banks didn't do. Nobody was doing this, right? And yet here people are. But, but here's the thing I noticed. Those managers for uh, years later, up until I left the bank, and even when I saw some of them afterwards, always remembered that session. They always remember how close they became to each other, how uh, how how transparent it how 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 okay it was to just be transparent and open about their lives, and to tell the truth and to have some tears around other people who who seem to care about them, and that's what kind of told me as I was leaving the bank in the middle of 1998 that there's a better way to kind of get to people. If what we really want is, is people to be kind of better humans, then we got to do the work of helping them be better humans. And so I slowly, over the next three to four years, just kind of built a body of, of workshops that I honed and honed. And, you know, as you're well aware, building workshops, so, you know, the first version was very different from the 10th or 11th. And, but after a while, it would be hit a place where it was, it was powerful and transformational and repeatable. And that would be kind of my go-to-market product. And then I jumped, you know, bumped into the thing of 
I didn't see a whole lot of people that looked like me in this game of transformation, let alone consulting, let alone consulting around management and leadership. So um, that was real lonely, still is, in fact, because I still seldom bump into people that do kind of my version of that stuff or, or some version that's in the, in the realm of what I do. So it's been a kind of a lonely career for the last, you know, 20 something years, but one that remains really powerful and and where I feel it makes a difference where I I just hear from people constantly about what it meant to, for them to go through some of the work that I've done. And so um so yeah. that was it. You know, I, I wanted to go back to yeah the comment about you have begun to do some work on myself on yourself and trying to be more of a conscious human being you know i think for for myself i know trying to be better every day and then trying to find ways to be more aware and be more conscious what did that look like for you <laughs> like specifically what did that look like for you day in and day out to really work on yourself in terms of how you you know took a, a particular path to get to a particular place. So, uh, well, I have to I have to give you this character. My mom would say that I'm kind of mule headed. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but just kind of, <laughs> yeah. just kind of. Yeah. And so, the universe in 1990 had been trying to get my attention all year. So let me just run this down for you. Um, let's see. I had shingles. I had um, four bleeding ulcers. Two two visits to intensive care with uh, five plus unit transfusions. I had um, what's called reflex sympathetic nerve dystrophy. I had fractured my foot because I used to power walk about 50 miles a week, and it wouldn't heal. And so the foot, every time I tried to walk for you know, a month later, the foot was extremely painful. Um, and was super painful. I started limping, and the doctor went in and looked at it, saw how red it was. He goes, it's not broken. Your foot is healed. It's just that your brain won't turn those nerves back off. And so you still think it hurts, but I'm going, it hurts. He goes, yeah, but it's not kind of real. And so I had all these things kind of happening around the nervous system. Um, and then cause, because I still wasn't kind of waking up, um, the uh, universe sent the coup de grace, and it slammed me upside of the head with a, with a two-by-four when I was driving 70 miles an hour with my ex back from my visit and my mother-in-law with a grand mal panic attack. Mm. And I mean, I literally, I still remember just driving through the desert, uh, heading back to Tucson, and literally wanted to just let go of the wheel and take off running across the desert. I mean, it's just like, it feel like just somebody just snipped all of the logic bar. I had, I had become Spock-like as a way to kind of get through life, so hiding from all feelings and all of that stuff. My family was not that family. Mm. And so feelings were not okay. There was no encouragement. There was no bonding. There was just 11 strangers growing up in this house, right? And so uh, my way to get through that was to just shut down all of, the, all of the emotional stuff by the time I was 12, 13 years old. I mean, and so I checked myself in the Tucson Psychi Psychiatric Institute um, to deal with the depression that hit right after the panic attack. I just, I just fell into this depression and just crying and sobbing and, and um, checked myself in. Uh, by the way, I took my computer with me. I had a first-generation laptop computer, so I took it with me, figuring, typical man thing, right, figuring I'll get some work done for the bank while they fix this emotional shit that's going on with me. And, of course, they took my computer and then took all of my sharp instruments and everything else. Um, but I came out of that recognizing that, that all that noise and swirling inside of me, where I thought I was crazy most of my life and I was just repressing it all, was actually all of this feeling and stuff, that it wasn't okay to have in my family, in my neighborhood, anywhere. And... I came out of there just looking for anything that was about my life as a man. There was a guy in there teaching a program, this old country-ass white guy from Ar Hot Springs, Arkansas, who's still one of my dear friends up in Pulse in Montana. But he had a program called Men as Fathers, Men as Sons, Men as Brothers, Men as Lovers, Men as Friends. And that's when I just sit there remembering that, first of all, it's okay to talk about this stuff, which wasn't okay in my family. 
And second, there is information out there about this stuff. So, Jim, how old are you at this point? I'm 66. I'm at the point you're discussing right oh, now. Oh, at, at the, um, well, this is 1990, so what is that? 20 years ago? 46? Young. 45, 46. And so I, found, I came out of Tucson, Tucson Psychiatric Institute two, two weeks later, really just pumped up going, I'm not crazy. Something has happened mm-hmm. to me, and I need to find out what. And so all those books I used to walk by in Barnes and & Nobles and Borders, that was the self-help thing, like it's like don't need that shit, that's for weak people, and just walk on through there. All of a sudden I'm in there re- grabbing books just by the dozens. And anything that jumped out at me, I've read, and, you know, I have a good memory, and so I just started just pulling all of this stuff into my I mean, literally reading three or four books at a time. Uh, found a 12-step group that let me in, even though I didn't have an alcohol or drug problem, but it's like, I remember sitting there saying, if you guys don't mind, I'd, I'd just listening, I want, I want to be able to talk like this, and... And could I do this? I don't have drugs, alcohol, that's not my thing. But I'm, I feel as screwed up as you guys. So it's okay if I stay? And they said, sure. So that's, that's the thing that taught me about how circles can work to support people, especially circles of like-minded institutes. I mean, think about the connection in my life from that to your form, right? It's the same thing to right. me. And so I learned the power of circles. And... Um, and just proceeded to kind of work various circles. And then I got into the men's work. Those were all circles, large and small, for by the, you know. So I've set just t- tens of thousands of circles in my life now. So, you know, increasingly, we live in a world where it feels like certain folks in society are less inclined to have conversations around gender specificity. Yeah. Right, you want to be have a more fluid conversation uh, around gender identification, but I hear you talk a lot about being a man mm. and training men. So, what are the underpinnings of that, and why is that so important to focus on gender in the work that you do? Well, I don't I don't particularly focus on gender because one of the things I got early on in this thing that I've been in for the last 20 years, the last 30, is that the stuff that I was learning was not about gender, it was about humans. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I call my work better human work. It was about, there there is a core level of skills necessary to be effective in our lives as humans. Mm -hmm. And so, and that cuts, that cuts up under all the gender stuff. Are there some gender specific things? Yes. But, you know, the men's work, that was the thing that was available in 1993. These, all of a sudden, I see a notice that they're putting on this thing called a Mankind Project is putting on his first training in Arizona. And I'm going, you know, I'm going to that. By then I had been reading and doing all that. It's like, I'm going to go to that. It was kind of weird because it was me and, you know, basically 29 uh, uh, mostly white guys that went through, and then the staff was about 40 white guys, and that's it was like, okay, I don't know where, know where the black people are in this and where are the people of color, but I'm going to do this because I am not going to go through my life screwed up. And and if, if I can learn why I did what I did, then maybe I can help the next person not lose their daughter as well And so, because the cost is too high. And so... Um, I've picked up, you know, doing that work for 18 straight years. So I worked my way up to leading those weekends all over the world, became chairman of that not-for-profit for a while. And uh, and, and so I, a, a big body of where I've learned about humans was working on men. Yeah. If you really want to work on things like emotions, um, vision, accountability, responsibility, uh, transparency, vulnerability, all that stuff, work with men because we are hard cases, right? We are hard cases to kind of get th- get through with that. So women have a lot more permission in society and to, to talk about feelings and to bond with each other and to connect. And we as men kind of go through these lives of isolation if, we, if something doesn't wake us up, right? And so... I'm grateful for that because it taught me how to work with the toughest kind of humans, which was which was men. And then out of that work, I ended up working with like uh, in Folsom Prison with level four in a level four maximum security cell block, which was mostly black and brown men, but also 
you know, that small group was will in, the, in that prison was willing to work on themselves and, and just, uh, you know, I started working with boys 12 to 17 and recognized, well, that's where it all starts, right? The stuff that I'm looking back at about how I grew up, that's happening in their lives right now. So if I can help them kind of transit, transit through that part of their life. And so I just put all that stuff together. And as I started, kept building workshops that get to how do I help humans, including myself, be a better human first and foremost. And that's the work I still do. That's the work that I took to your forum. You know, it's not gender specific. When I work with spouse forums, I do the same things. It's just that when I am working with men, I have some additional insight from a couple of, you know, from 18 years of just working with men by the tens of thousands all over the world. But it's uh, human work. That's all it is. You know, that's really, you know, again, super interesting, particularly when you talk about uh, feeling isolated um, mm. as as a man, particularly as a black man, and I and I say this to my wife all the time, you know, that she has permission to do things in a way where I've never felt permission to. Otherwise, there would be consequences. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and, and when I say consequences, not favorable consequences in terms of you know what I was trying to project in the world, right, or who I was trying to be in the moment. And I think. Probably, I'd say over the last few years, I think as you get older in life, you know, you start to care a little less uh, and you, you feel like there's there's more of your true essence and self that you need to let the world see. And I think I'll give a lot of credit to the conversation that DJ and I have been having as, as one of those opportunities for me to do that. Um, do you think that as, as men, and particularly as black men, that having a more powerful voice in the world is super important for us to carry on, I think, a really important agenda about how we connect humanity. And mm. we play a big role in that, I think, because how we engage is super critical because I think other people are watching and passing judgment one way or the right. other. Right. And, and you, you and I were having a conversation yesterday, and I think largely what I was, what I was asking you when we were sort of going back and forth was, what do we do? Like, how do we do things in a way where it's productive and we don't let our worst thoughts surround what we think of other people and how they perhaps may perceive us or how they may treat us dictate how we treat them in return and what we do to try to make things better? Huh? I know that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. One of the things that, um, you know, I think you, you reached out to me because you saw my offer on LinkedIn yes. that I was wanting to share what I have learned in 30 years of doing very deep and transformational work and growth uh, with more black people because it's rare that I see them in the startups. It's rare that I see them in the corporations that I work with. It's rare that I see them in YPO. Um, and the part of me that just has this sadness about, you know, all of us deserve a chance to hear the messages of how do we get our lives to work better. And I've been one of those bringers, you know, in my limited capacity for 30 years. And, and so how do I just now, it feels like there's a part of me right now that's just turning toward, um, how do I just share this more with people that look like me? It would be nice to look out and see some tearful black men and women in front of me finally getting that it is okay to have these feelings and it is okay to talk about what happened with my dad and and how rough he was and it is okay for me to you know to be vulnerable and, and that doesn't make me weak or any of that kind of nonsense that we grow up it just makes me human and so um I, you know for me that place of modeling um, is important to me, that place of, of uh, bringing this message that constantly gives people a choice about how they want to show up is important to me. Um, the, you know, one of my favorite questions that I learned from the men's work that I poke people in the eye with constantly is what's at risk? You know, what's at risk if you don't start, start talking about those feelings that you're having? You know, what's at risk if you don't learn to, you know, deal with your with your anger differently? What's at risk? And really put people at that choice point that says, you may not change your behavior, but you'll never be able to say again that you don't know what it's going to cost you in all your relationships if you don't do what we talked about in this workshop. So I, you know, my job is to just keep poking people in the eye, my whole workshops. And so, you know, from the standpoint of, of um, 
how do we engage the world as black men? You know, one of the things that that us I used to spend a lot of energy, uh, Charles, a lot of energy thinking I'm well spoken. I speak the King's English, you know, all that stuff I learned going to all those integrated schools, and so I know how to get along with white folks, and so. Why don't I just talk to them about some how this stuff is and how it isn't and all that? And that was just exhausting work for me. It was just exhausting. And it was like I was telling you on the phone that I had uh, some black men from Chicago in the, in the warrior work. That's what they call that stuff with MKP, uh, modern day warriors. So in the warrior work, these black men from Chicago basically educated me about 10 years ago saying, that's not your job as a black man. Your job is not to is to be the mentor for white people learning to look at their own racism. That's something they're going to have to figure out. Your job is to take care of you, Jim Mitchell. And I started paying more attention to that. So um, if the conversations do come up, you know, because, again, the kind of work that I do, I've learned how do I be in those conversations truthfully, authentically? How do I say things in a way that's useful? So the fact that I got a friend that's, you know, sending me crap kind of email Getting real outrageous with them is probably not going to help them or me do anything different. But how do I set some boundaries and learn to have a conversation that's that's at least useful to both of us, that I'm proud of me because of how I engage the subject, but I'm also very clear, very direct, very truthful about kind of impacts around that stuff so that they at least are at a choice point now. And I, I think that's as good as some of it gets. That's important, Jim, because, I, you know, and I'll just, I'll just speak specifically to Charles. Charles is one of the most intellectual and intelligent men that I've had the pleasure to be around. So, I agree with that. So who, regardless of what race you are, you're going to try to suck some of that up. Yep. And you got to be careful where you allow that to happen. There's so much juice in, in the tree, right? And in, in the So that's my thing is when we start to give that up and entertain some of these conversations, when folks really aren't intending to improve. Right. That's not their objective. We just have to be careful around that because what are we not doing right. when we're focused on that? I want to come back to one thing, too, because I was actually inspired when I started to understand uh, some of the work you're doing around gender because I do think it's important, you know, regardless of, of where certain aspects of society may be trying to take us. Because when we start to pay less attention to it, I think one of the things we do forget, and from a dual marginalization standpoint, specifically is black women. And we don't have that conversation enough. Right. And, you know, in talking to my mom, uh, women I've dated, friends in corporate America, if we don't stay close to that, it's easy to think they deal with the same things the same way white women might right. deal with them. And right. we know that that's not true. Right. So I think the, the gender conversation continues to be really important. Um, and I was actually inspired to see you focusing on that, even though through the lens of, of, of men. Um, I think the gender conversation is as important at times as the race conversation, and especially as it relates to you know, minorities, what we call minorities. Right. So... Um, I tell you what, man, a, a lot of what you're talking about, um, I personally do consulting as well, yeah. culture, leadership development, DE and I. One of the questions I'd, I'd like you to maybe talk to Charles and I about is this whole concept of personal values. Because a lot of times what we see, and I, I'm going to guess you've encountered it, a lot of times when you're dealing with the folks at the highest level of the corporation, their first thought is all of this training is for the rest of the organization right. and not necessarily their transformation that's required to make this happen. Can you speak to your experiences there? Yeah, in fact, um, the, the person that came to mind is um, this really powerful sister. I think she's married to George Lucas. Oh, yeah. I know you're talking about uh, Hobson. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So when that company was smaller, she reached out to what used to I used to uh, subcontract to a consulting group inside of Aon. And, um, and because I was the black guy, right, with that group, they ended up pushing that to me. And so, but I still remember on the phone call with her and whoever her partner in that venture was at the time, basically saying, as we talked about what's going on in the organization, what's going on in the culture, saying something about... Um, well, we want you to do all this for our, our people, you know, 
And I'm going, well, you know, it would be a lot more powerful if we start with you guys. It's like, no, we don't have time for it, but can you do it for our people? And that was the thing in that moment where I learned that lesson 35 years ago or something, whenever that was, of, um, you know, if upper management is exempting themselves from the work, then they're the problem in the culture. And so if they're not willing to do it, then I'm not interested in working with that company because, because it won't stick. Right. I've worked inside of Raytheon, the big defense contractors, where at best I can create a more enlightened manager running a specific team on a specific weapons program. Right. But it can't get any bigger than that because those that that team and that manager cannot influence, you know, a company with 100,000 people in it. And so this stuff starts at the top. That's the only way that it has any chance of working, which is, again, why I like startups. Um, Robert Holman, the, uh, the, who was the CEO of um, Glassdoor.com, I mean, he came to the first eight sessions that I put on for that company when they were, they were probably still around like 100 people. And he would sit there and right there in front of, you know, God and everybody else work on his life in front of his people. And he wasn't shy about it and he would talk about it. And he would come back to the next one and the next one. And then the, that went a, a, like a huge way toward telling people in this culture, this is who we are. This is who we're going to be. Because it was coming right from, how do you say that I'm not going to do this when the CEO is right over there working on his relationship with his kids, right? And so... Um, I find that that's more powerful, and I'm willing to wait out um, customers and opportunities to get to the ones where I really do see it's going to be kind of top down. And then I'm, I'm willing to give it everything I got to help them build that culture based on ideas like values. You know, to me, two of the big things that I talk about in forums, I talk about in, in all of my corporate work, is about a personal vision and personal values. You know, personal vision is answers the questions to a, a very, you know, variety of formats, as you're aware, but it's trying to get to who and how do I want to be in this part of my life. So that I have some kind of guidance system, some kind of operational system that, that governs my behavior so that when things are coming at me, I don't, I don't have reactions to that stuff. I source a response from the vision of, that I already have of who and how I want to be in this part of my life. And a key part of that, step one, when I roll this process in my workshops or retreats is, what are the four to six core values that you want to make your relationship as a dad based on? Because if you don't know what those are, then how are you going to bring those to the relationship, you know? And so when the relationship is getting hammered by stuff and it's beginning difficult and challenging, you got no values to hold on to. So job one is, is identify that. And, you know, you're in this game. It's amazing how much people can struggle when I send them, the way, send them a way to work on this to just struggle to come up with the values they want to be about. And then, of course, there is the hard work of having them understand, well, I want to be more compassionate. Well, then let's talk about what you're doing now and what that's costing you. And let's talk about what's going to have to shift inside of you so that you can actually be more compassionate. Because otherwise, you're just saying a really powerful word that don't mean spit, uh-huh. right? So now we got it. So that's what I love about the work that I do is about taking all of these big transformational words and phrases and opportunities and making them tangible for people. So that, you know, I always say, you know, my job is to make sure when they walk out the door, they can do this stuff immediately with the next person and then with their family and with their job and everything else. I'm not interested in a lot of the more kind of touchy-feely parts of growth and transformation. It's like I'm not going to sit, 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 sit people in a circle and make them stare at a candle and see what happens. That's just not my <laughs> or, you know, it might work for some other people. It's just, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. For me, this is about can you walk out of the door and be different in your life in a way that you're more, you go to bed more proud of you about how you're showing up and what you're bringing to your kids and to your honey and to your family and to your friends and to your work. You know, Jim, back to that, the, the values piece. DJ and I talk a lot about values, mm-hmm. and we think they're very important in terms of not only our, our personal identity, but also how we interact with others, like what those values look like. And DJ articulated, articulated that very well a little bit earlier. Do you think that when you would come across people who have that struggle with 
just sharing or knowing what their values are? Is that because we've somewhere stumbled along the way as a society to help people understand what values in the world are important? Or is it because we're so influenced by other things out in the world, like the things that we get attracted to, whether it's social media, whether it's just mm. uh, the, the newsreel or whatever you want to call that, or just you know, not having an opportunity to really, really sit and understand who you are as an individual and what's important to you. What, what do you think the reason for that is? Well, I think one, it's just not something that's valued, and especially in this society where you know, we want to, we have this horseshit belief around meritocracy is the only, you know, true way to be successful. And so, um, you know, you just kind of get out there and you work harder than the next person and you're guaranteed success and you don't need to know anything else. That's all you need to do is just work harder than them. And it's like, no, I mean, one of the big lessons I get from YPO is people who are phenomenally, I've been working with YPO 12, 13 years, people phenomenally brilliant like you. Who, bring, who come in, I'm not serious when I say that, like you Thank brilliant you. people. I met some, some of the smartest people on the planet in YPO. And, but it's kind of interesting that when, as soon as we get away from building empires and we start talking about, you know, tell me the two or three values that drive you when you're fathering your Amazing. kids or when you're mothering your kids, they, they just get like a cow look on their face, right? They don't know what the answer to that is. And that's because that hasn't been valued. Nobody along the way has said it is important that you have values to guide yourself. Except, and this is also, I think, in addition to the two things you mentioned, where this gets co-opted, is a lot of people associate values with religion. I'm not religious. I'm, I'm a hardcore atheist. I just don't believe any of that. And one of the things I have made in my job and my work is to reclaim values from the province of religion. People used to think I was a preacher in my early workshops, and I would get pissed off because to me that was kind of like an insult. <laughs> and it's like, don't say that. Why are you saying that? I just really care about this stuff. But they're not used to hear people speaking passionately about mm -hmm. values. And that's what I was doing, and I'm going, oh, that's what they're noticing. And so I think that place that says... Um, it's, it's been co-opted. we got to kind of liberate it from any kind of religious constraint. For example, the word compassion. Anytime you hear that word, it, people immediately want to go to kind of more religious and biblical kind of references. And it's like, no, compassion is about understanding that humans suffer. We suffer because we want this, but our lives is that. And we, that gap between what we want and what we actually got in our current lives causes pain and suffering. My job is to be able to sit with that person and see that they suffer. The only way I can do that is to understand and know my own suffering and to not judge each of us for that, to simply recognize trying to figure out this human journey thing is hard-ass work. And to try to get those gaps to close in at least some parts of our life takes a very disciplined and ongoing, dedicated place of working on ourselves and working on ourselves in conjunction with others. But I don't need to judge you before the fact that your life is not working the way you want in certain parts. My job is to be with you while you work through that. See what I can learn about me while you're working through it. So, so I want to. I think it's that. I think it's this. We got to recapture that. We got to let people know that values are the big drivers of behaviors. And Jim, you know, one of the things I talk to a lot of business leaders about in my practice is you will soon find there's a fork in the road between. Your corporate value system, what, what you value as a leader when you walk in here and work with your organization and how you live your life at home. You can't live in those dichotomies yeah. for long. Yeah. Because one's going to self-discover the other. Yeah. And you're going to be conflicted. And that's going to come to light. So the things you do at home and how you live in your home and the community that you have at home and who you surround yourself with what you say in the backyard will come to life in the front yard when you walk in to that office. Yeah. You may get by with that for a certain amount of time, but at some point, the two roads will meet. How do you work through that 
with business leaders who think it's okay, they can do the Clark Kent scenario. Right. I can be Clark here, but when I come in here, I'm Superman and everybody buys the S. Right. How do you work through that huh. with leaders? Well, that's kind of interesting because that you know that makes me think about like a lot of the work I've done with the YPO and the thousands of YPOs I've worked with, and and um, and that is, for example, one of the big traits that's part of the executive demographic is to be able to problem solve rapidly. So to hear two or three data points immediately go to solution seeking and problem solving, and so part of what I you know, illuminate for them is when you're building empires, that's a powerful skill to have, to be able to just, because you got so many fires to put out every day, then to be able to hear just a couple of three data points, immediately, you know, ask a couple of key problem solving questions and then go to solution. Tell me how that's working with you and your 14 year old. When they come to you and they need to talk about the fact yeah. that they're sprouting hair, that their voice is going crazy on them, that kids are bullying them, and then you immediately do what you do at work and you cut them off and ask very pointed questions that generally start driving them to, you know, toward what you think they should have done in that situation. But in essence, what it's doing is driving them away from talking to you because you don't feel that's, safe that's, for them. That's really right. interesting. Right. Because it no longer feels safe. And, you know, anytime I survey a group and say, what happens when your kids, when you do that, Oh, they roll their eyes. They just kind of stiffen their body, cross their arms, and then pretty soon they go, okay, you know, Dad, thanks a lot, and they just leave and go do something else. But I said, but what you've told them in that moment is don't talk to you. Mm -hmm. that you're not appropriate to talk to about, about what I have an acronym, RTRS, real talk about real shit. You're not appropriate for them for those comments. Now think about that. This is your 12-year-old. This is your 8-year-old, and you've already taught them don't talk to you. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time doing what I call metaphorically slapping CEOs upside the head and senior executives, <laughs> <laughs> which is basically about, come on, whatever you're using to build empires, uh, we can talk about that later. But we really got to talk about the set of skills that you have undernourished your whole life. Mm -hmm. You've undersought out and you've undernourished. And so they have withered on the vine. That is about you being husband and you being dad and you being mom and you being sister, you being daughter. So let's talk about those skills. What's going to help those relationships flourish and thrive? And so it's been a fun ride. I have to tell you, it's been an amazingly fun ride the last 20-something years of doing this, 30-something Sounds like years. you've had an amazing <laughs> amount of value, man, to, to folks' lives personally and professionally. I, I take my hat off to you. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I appreciate that. You know, Jim, one, one of the things I want to go back to but can I just respond to that? Absolutely. So, but I tell you the thing that the work I have done, once I kind of came up with what I think are the kind of the basic structures of making our lives work, at least in the world of Jim Mitchell and testing those and getting a lot of feedback going, that's powerful, just life altering. You know, I keep doing it. I have the same passion today as I had 15 years ago to talk about these ideas, like how your feelings work and what they're for and what they're trying to tell you and how do you use them in a conversation. That's still a powerful conversation because the great body of humans out there, especially in this society, maybe others, but at least familiar with this one, we aren't progressing around that stuff. I, I bump into the same ignorance about what your feelings are supposed to do today that I did 20 years ago. And that surprises me because sometimes that's in something, you know, like a white pill forum where, you know, it's millionaires and billionaires and people who have built amazing things and, and all of that. And yet the same ignorance about what are my feelings trying to tell me. And so I do the work for two reasons. One of them is, um, you know, when a father or mother can come up to me after my workshop and say, or when they're checking out and say, for the first time in my life, I feel like I know how to talk with my kids. Mm. And I'm going, how old are your kids? They're, you know, 9 and 11. It's like, shh. God, glad we caught this today, right? But I also do the work because every time I say this stuff, I learn more about me. So I do my work. I, I, I'm not one of those facilitators that throw out a bunch of ideas and, you know, he who gets them, gets them, she who gets them, gets them. 
I go into the waters with them. It's like, for me, it's like, I'm going in first. Now you guys want to come into these waters with me and see what we can all learn about ourselves. And so I facilitate my workshop, but I also participate in it fully and completely. That's the only way I know how to do this. The day I stop doing that, I don't want to do this work anymore. Yes, sir. You, um, and I've, I've actually experienced that too, and that's really real. Um, you mentioned early on about some of the work you wanted to do is the LinkedIn article that you that yeah. you uh, you wrote um, around black professionals yeah. uh, and, and creating a, a, a an opportunity for there be a to be a forum that you can facilitate the help. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, what I'm trying to do again is I want to share that that this idea. At least I think I've codified a pretty good version of a series of concepts that can help our lives, again, be more passionate, be more open, be more transparent, be more connected to the people we most care about, be more connected to ourselves, right, which is job one. And so um, I've actually come up with the 15 lessons now that I actually want to roll out. And the biggest thing I'm still trying to solve is how do I price this thing? Um, and then, uh, and then, of course, in finding candidates to go through it, I'm not sure how to solve for those two yet. Um, I have two here, maybe. Yeah. But, but the thing that I'm I'm uh, wanting to do is recognize that everybody's out there doing the meritocracy thing, right? Trying to scrabble and struggle, and, you know, and get get ahead, get ahead again, including black people, just like I did in my executive career jillion black people out there, you know, trying to rise in organizational life. But this, the problem is still consistent in that all of those folks probably highly likely that they have never seen the value of slowing down way, way, way down, going inside what I call going inward and downward in the heart and soul inside and just exam doing self-examination, doing deep reflection on the self. And so it's easy to get trapped in that thing that says, well, I'm just going to chase this American dream thing and I'm going to ignore everything else. Well, some of what I'm ignoring is my relationship with my kids and with my sister and with my siblings and everything else is faltering. But it's like, that's just life because I got to get this American dream thing. And I'm not there to say, stop chasing the American dream. I'm coming into this other piece that says, can we talk about all that stuff that's getting left in your wake? Because some of that stuff seems to be some people you care about. One of the things I point out, you've heard me talk about this, that I point out is that, you know, there's 8,000 million people on the planet, right? 8 billion citizens on the planet. And the question I always ask folks is, guess how many of them you actually really give a shit about? About 25 or 30 of them. Now think about that as a fraction. You care about 30 people out of 8 billion. Well, if we brought those 30 people in through this door right now and ask them to sit here in the chair of truth and talk about what it's like to be in relationship with you and what values do you bring to that relationship, what do you think they would say? And that's when people's bottom lips start doing that thing right and their eyes get that first little sheen in them because all of a sudden it's like they've never slowed down to actually consider those people that way. They've just figured that's just life. You know, you work hard. The kids must know. Mom must know. Everybody must know I'm sacrificing for them. My dad did that for 37 years with Mountain Bell, what used to be the old telephone kit system, right? It says get up, go work three jobs, feed your family. And that's all that matters. Well, what about us four boys that would, wouldn't mind if you came to a baseball game with us? Or no time for that stuff, right? And so I don't want to turn people off from working hard to be prosperous, especially black people. I mean, which, uh, we do, right? And so I don't want to stop anybody from that, that getting after whatever their version of the American dream and, and wild success is. I just want all of us, including me, not to leave so much wreckage behind us. And so um, the reason I want to work with black folks is I think I'm, I offer a face that looks familiar, 
maybe not 100% kind of then overlap on their experience if they blew up, grew up in some place like Atlanta or Chicago, because I grew up in Chandler with a super small black population. But some of this stuff about our experience is not based on where we came from. It's based on how the rest of this society treats us, and mm -hmm. that gives us a common thread. Mm -hmm. and so I still think that I'm relatable to those audiences, and... And I'm willing to kind of test that in this work I want to do in these this series of 15 workshops. And that's a long, that's a lot to ask people to say to do 15 hour and a half sessions. That's like working through a semester of college or something. But it's like we're either yes. going to get this stuff into our brains and hearts and souls so we can actually use it in our relationships, or we just keep looking around and wondering why do my relationships feel so sad all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I think that is so important because, you know, we do work hard, right? We do work really hard to try to provide for our families yep. and try to, um, you know, do other things that improve the lives of people that you come in contact with, whether it's, you know, being involved in a community board or, um, you know, just being active uh, out in the world where you can feel like you're contributing. Right. And if you don't take that time to really focus on some of the things that are important to you, that make you who you are, um, and then be okay with that, right? And I think a lot of times, you know, trying to focus on the things that you are not or don't have is really a distraction for what good is in your life, right? And what good that you can do in the world just by being who you are. And if you're comfortable with that, then all those other things will take care of themselves. And you're able to have these relationships that are so important with your kids, with your friends, with your family, people that really, to your point, that group of 25, 30 people, you have an opportunity to impact them in ways where they know that you care about them in the same vein that they care about you. Yeah. And I think that that connection, um, specifically I talk about for myself, you know, I just want more love in the world. I want yeah. more love in my life. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not just in my intimate relationship with my, my wife, but with the people that I'm around, that my, my friends, my family, the people who I feel, you know, impact me. I want to be able to provide that same level of connection with them. And that's where, you know, when I want to focus on things that are outside of what may be my, you know, my 10, 12, 14 hour job, whatever time that frame that may be, right. I want to give a lot more of that time back to those people who impact me in, in a way that I'm just so grateful for. Well, and one of the things I just want to point out that I do get why especially black professionals are willing to kind of ignore everything except the chase, right? Because, again, when you look at opportunity and success and, and, and fortune deferred for centuries in this country, there's a lot of pent-up energy for black folks to kind of get oh, yeah. some, right? Right. And so I'm all about that. I've been trying to get my little piece as well, right? And that place that just says the price is too high if we don't stop and slow down and pay attention to the rest of how our lives is working or how it fails to work. And so it's about it's not about either or, it's about what is the both and that you can build into this, that you can have powerful, highly effective, highly efficient, functioning, thriving relationships and still get you a piece of the pie. So I want, I want to see what I can do to help more black folks get to the both end around this. Yeah, and that's not water we can just put our toe in. I yeah. mean, that, that gets deeper and deeper oh, you know, yeah. every minute that we <laughs> talk about it. Yeah. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. Is there anything you'd like to ask us or add before you leave us? This has been great. Yeah. Hmm. Now, you're, you're a deep brother, so be careful. Don't, don't make us look crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the last 60 seconds. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things I am curious about is in your current life, what is what is one of those gaps that you've just been dancing with but not paying attention to between how you'd like it to be in that part of your life and how it is mm. rather than the place of settling down and doing the hard work to, to close that gap? What's one of those gaps that you've been kind of I'll quickly hit it. Um, for me, I think this whole concept of cancel culture has become interesting mm. for me. So if I hear enough narratives from someone who I may have valued that I no longer value, 
how do I work through canceling the person versus the narratives mm. and continuing to value that person and what they do bring versus some of the narratives? I'm like, are you, are you serious? Did you really just say that? Do you really think that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, especially for folks, you know, in the black community, because I don't want to get into this thing of we have to agree upon everything. Right. But what's that core foundational alignment that we have to have that allows us to operate and move forward? Yeah. I'm continuing to search for, for what that is and not become, you know, the human eraser where it's like I want nothing to do with you anymore. We just don't agree on that. So I continue to work through that. Mm. I, honestly, not not to be a copycat here, but I think for me it's probably the exact same mm-hmm. issue. And and I think it, it, for me it's probably in a much broader context, meaning that you know in the world that I move in a lot with, uh, not just obviously my my black friends, but you know more so perhaps even with my white friends that yeah. I'm in contact with. Yeah. And how do I move around them in a way where when I hear something that just is completely off to me. Like I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, just over a quick cocktail, and you know, someone who I would think is a lot more progressive, but he made the comment around, um, he shared that, yeah, you know, I've thought about, you know, bringing, you know, when I bring an African-American person in to my organization, you know, am I really not doing them a, a, a proper service and so am I doing them a disservice by bringing them in an environment where people may not accept them uh, and I'm going well wait a minute yeah that's kind of viewing it the wrong <laughs> way I mean it seems like you'd be talking to the people in your organization and yourself you know right and so it just kind of and it, it just threw me yes. off because I just you know I, I didn't expect it and so how do you navigate through those conversations in a way where, where well-meaning people yeah um just stay, you know, and, and this is, I'll take a Jim Mitchell phrase and just say stupid shit. And, and, and how do you deal with that in a way where it's constructive and productive yeah. and that you can continue moving forward with that relationship yeah. without having to say, yeah, yeah, I'm done. Like, I'm, I, like I, I don't want to do that. And so that's a big piece of it for me. DJ and I go back and forth with this conversation a lot. And, um, and, and I appreciate his perspective. And I think he's right in a lot of ways. And I'm just trying to figure out how to yeah. navigate it the best I can. I'll share mine real quick, and that's about my one of my core values is, in fact, compassion. And I've worked really hard the last 30 years to be a more compassionate person. And this challenge with these folks who just won't wear a mask and keep going to stuff, and all of a sudden they didn't kill their grandma or they didn't kill their brother, so, yeah. it's like, no question. you know, uh, I'm, I, I've been in a struggle. It's like, well, I'm supposed to feel compassion for them now? They didn't done some stupid shit. Yeah, just put it on. That, the way they just did it, somebody, and now I'm supposed to be... Comp- <laughs> and one of my mentors it's basically crazy. says, yes, you are. you got to separate what they're doing from their humanity. You still need to be compassionate toward their humanity, Jim Mitchell. So that's where I'm working right now is... How do I separate all that stupid behavior from the human and Absolutely. still be compassionate with the human? Well, Jim. Thanks for the invitation, No, gentlemen. thank you. This has been, been great. Uh, it's been amazing. And uh, you playing golf today? That's where you're headed? I'm playing later, yes. You coming? So I hear you play like nine times a week or something like that. <laughs> you know what? You know, I'm still, a, trying, a, I'm still a, waiting for the invite. Only yeah. on a I bad this, week. I get, on a this bad sort week. Of, I get this sort of <laughs> half, like, you know... <laughs> Sort of the invite, you know, in the middle of the podcast. Uh, um, when, when you know, I've got like three meetings in the rest of the afternoon. So, um, yeah, I thought maybe you were. Where are you playing today? You going to come? <laughs> <laughs> got those meetings. Uh, 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 this has been great. Thank you again. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for joining the po- uh, Conscious Vibe podcast, and um, see you next time. <laughs>